folks, and welcome to Defense of the Faith Ministries ongoing teaching module series on the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement. Last time we talked about some interesting things about the tongues aspect or the flagship uh, phenomena, which is the tongues movement. This time we're going to pick it up in part three and continue with our series on the Pentecostal movement. The next thing, the next reason we are going to uh, not be able to defend or even go along with the Pentecostal or Charismatic movement is because everything needs to be done orderly, and it isn't. The Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. The God of creation is a God of order. He's not the God of confusion and disorder. George Gardner was a Pentecostal for a whole lot of years, and he said that his journey out of Pentecostalism began with nagging questions about the gulf between the charismatic practices and scriptural statements, actually a very wide gulf. This is from Gardner, The Corinthian Catastrophe, page 8. He determined to study the book of Acts, and he says this, I reread the book of Acts, slowly and carefully, praying as I did. Lord, let me see what it says, and only what the Word says. Give me the grace to accept it if I have been wrong, and grace to apologize if I have been unduly critical. The journey through Acts was an eye-opener for him. The actions and the experiences of the early churches were far removed from the actions and experiences of the modern tongues movement. In some ways, they were completely opposite. Well, number seven, major point number seven, why defense of the faith ministries cannot go along with or concur with this Pentecostal charismatic tongues movement. And it's this, the Pentecostal tongues movement is unscriptural. This movement and method of speaking in tongues is not only unscriptural, but it's dangerous. Biblical tongues were not sought after, they or learned for that matter. They were sovereignly given by God according to His will and purpose. If we are to agree that there is such a thing today as tongue speaking or a private prayer language and that it would help us to live better lives as Christians. We would accept this challenge to try it and see and if we accepted the charismatic challenge of to try it and see the next logical question would be how do I speak in this tongue? or prayer language. The first step, we're told, is to stop analyzing things carefully by the scriptures and to open up to new experiences. A chapter in his book, These Wonderful Gifts, by Michael Harper, is entitled Letting Go and Letting God, in which the believer is instructed to stop analyzing experiences so carefully and strictly to stop setting up alarm systems and squatting nervously behind protective walls. He says the believer should step out from behind these walls and infallible systems and just open up to God. That's a necessary but unscriptural and exceedingly dangerous step toward receiving charismatic experiences. Having stopped analyzing with Scripture, the standard method of experiencing the gift of tongues, or a private prayer language for that matter, is to open one's mouth and to start speaking words that no one understands. Don't speak in your own language, for sure, because God can't help you, they say, if you speak in your own language. And God will take control. Dennis Bennett says this, Open your mouth and show that you believe the Lord has baptized you in the Spirit by beginning to speak. <clears throat> he 
He goes on to say, don't speak English or any other language you know, for God can't guide you to speak in tongues if you're speaking in a known language, if you're speaking in any language that you understand. Just as a child learning to talk for the first time, open your mouth and speak out the first syllables and expressions that come to your lips. You may begin to speak, but only get out a few halting sounds. Now, that's wonderful, he says. You've broken the sound barrier. Keep in with it, those sounds. Offer them to God. Tell Jesus you love him in those joyful noises. In a very real sense, any sound you make offering your tongue to God in simple faith may be the beginning of speaking in tongues. And this is from the Holy Spirit and you, pages 76, 77, and 79. Folks, this is so grossly unscriptural and nonsensical, it almost it almost shouldn't even be honored with a refutation. There's absolutely nothing like this in the Bible, in the New Testament, anywhere. To ignore the Bible and to seek something that the Bible never says to seek in a way that doesn't even, that's not even supported by the Bible, is to open oneself up, to uncritically open oneself up to a religious experience. And it puts one in danger of receiving another spirit. 2 Corinthians 11.4 the Bible warns Christians very plainly that there are deceiving spirits that attempt to influence Christians and that can appear as angels of light or ministers of God. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, 13 through 15. Paul warned the Corinthians that they were in danger of receiving false spirits because of their carnal, tolerant, and undiscerning condition. 2 Corinthians again, 11, 3 and 4. The true Christian can't be possessed by um, evil spirits because the Holy Spirit is a jealous God. He will not allow that to happen. But the Christian can be oppressed and can certainly be influenced by these demonic spirits. If you are into experiential um, manifestations or living, you open yourself up for this attack by Satan. The Bible plainly teaches that tongues speaking was a divine miracle and it was sovereignly given. It says this, But all these worketh, that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man, severally as he will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The disciples did not seek to speak in tongues on the day of Pentecost, nor did they take a class on letting go and letting God. There is absolutely no evidence, in fact, that they even expected to speak in tongues. In every instance where Christians spoke in tongues, in the book of Acts, the tongues were sovereignly given. In no instance were the recipients seeking to speak in tongues. Well, major point then number eight, why Defense of the Faith Ministries cannot accept the tongues speaking movement, would be biblical tongues were not spoken by everyone. They were not spoken by everyone even as far back as the first century. The Bible says this, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of not wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, 
to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. 1 Corinthians 12, 28-30, he was of course speaking rhetorically when he asked these questions. Paul asks, as a part of that passage, do all speak with tongues? And the question is obviously no, not all do speak with tongues. The United Pentecostal Church, though, tries to get around this by making a distinction between tongues as the initial evidence of spirit baptism and tongues as a gift of the spirit. They say this in their rather convoluted defense. Quote, some people quote 1 Corinthians 12.30 in an attempt to prove that not all speak in tongues when they are filled with the Spirit. Do all speak in with tongues? However, this verse refers to the gift of tongues, that is, speaking a public message, in tongues to be interpreted for the congregation which is a spiritual gift that any person may exercise subsequent to the infilling of the Spirit. Though both tongues, as the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and tongues as a later spiritual gift are the same in essence, they are different in administration and operation. And this is from Why Did God Choose Tongues, United Pentecostal Church's website. Check it out, folks. It's there. This teaching, very plainly, does not hold up in the light of Scripture. A very simple survey of the book of Acts proves conclusively that not all believers in the early churches spoke in tongues. I'm going to give you a litany in a minute here of the many examples of how believers did not speak in tongues. So please bear with me if it gets to be repetitious. Even on the day of Pentecost, while the disciples were in the upper room, 120 of them, and they spoke in tongues, Acts 2.4. But those that were saved that day through Peter's preaching, and remember, no one was saved through a tongue's message, but through Peter's preaching. The others who were saved, about 3,000, were saved and they did not speak in tongues. Acts 2, 40 through 42. The Jews that believed in Acts 4, 4 and 6, 7 did not speak in tongues. The Ethiopian eunuch that was saved in Acts 8, 35-39 did not speak in tongues. The first people who were saved at Antioch, Acts 11, 20 and 21, did not speak in tongues. Lydia and her household who were saved in Acts 16, 13-15 and the Philippian jailer and his family who were saved in Acts 16, 30-33 did not speak in tongues. Those that were saved in Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens in Acts 17, 4, 12, and 34 did not speak in tongues. Crispus and others who were saved at Corinth in Acts 18, 8 did not speak in tongues. Those who believed at Ephesus, Acts 19, 17 through 19, did not speak in tongues. Folks, I, I've presented the dots to you. All you need to do is connect them. You're getting the impression that the great majority of believers... In